Hello. About 60 years ago, the field of artificial intelligence was created. And right from the beginning, the goal was to build software that is more intelligent than humans are. And since then, we have been asking the question, is AI smarter than humans? Well, I want to pass that question on to you for a second. Everyone who thinks that you are still smarter than AI, raise your hand. Great. Everyone who thinks that the AI is smarter than you, raise your hand. See, this is exactly what I expected. The opinions are very divided. And that's for a good reason, because recently we've seen many applications that just outperform human performance. But yet still, we don't see robots walking around being as smart as we are. We don't have AI that understands humor, and there are many other things that remain unsolved. So what I'm trying to attempt with this TED Talk is give you a more decisive answer than, well, it's not a yes and not a no to this question. Let's start by looking at some things where AI actually happens to be superhuman. This is the game of Go a game that we humans have been playing since 2,500 years, and a game that since 2016, AI is better at. And it's not like this is a simple game. This is actually a very complex game that was a main challenge of AI for decades before. And in fact, 2014, in 2014, the programmer of the AI that was best at Go at that time thought it would take another 10 years. But yet, in 2016, AlphaGo, developed by Google DeepMind, beat the world champion. And what I find most fascinating about this example is that in 2017, only one year later, we actually found that a version two of this same algorithm beat the version one by an even larger margin than the version one beat the world champion by. So this thing is getting better very quickly. And that's not the only example. Games are not the only example. See, some computer vision tasks, such as single object classification, which means you get an image and you say what the, prominent, the most prominent object in that image is, are also performed better than AI, uh, by AI than by humans. And in fact, that works with up to a thousand categories of images, which is pretty, si uh, pretty sick. I mean, since 2015, computer vision, or the subtask sub of single object classification, AI is better at it. Well, that's so much for superhuman, but one thing that I find particularly interesting about the state of AI is that AI can actually speak. Listen a single this. WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. Now, it's fast. See, this speech isn't created by vocal cords. It's created by Google's WaveNet version 2. This is completely simulated. That, it, that's 48,000 samples per second that sound pretty realistic coming from nowhere, not from vocal cords. So let's get back to our question. Is AI superhuman? Well, yes, we clearly see that in some applications it is, but in some it's just not. And to get a feeling for why that is, let me show you what AI actually is and how it works. This is a neural network. That's the core technology that's at the bottom of almost all innovations that happen in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence today. And contrary to what most of you might think, no, that core technology is not complex. It's, in fact, super simple. It's composed of inputs which could be the pixels of an image, could also be anything else. The only thing that matters is that it's a number. It has outputs, which could be probabilities. Say in the case of image classification, what you'd do is you'd feed the pixels of the image in, and out you would get the probability for each object that the neural network knows to exist. So if there is a dog, a cat, and a car, there would be a probability for each of these objects. The things in between are sort of like synapses and the neurons in our brain, or at least they try to be that. The synapses, the lines connecting the neurons, are the actual things that we can learn. This is what is changed when the neural network learns, when it, when it trains. You have also just numbers still. There is nothing else than numbers in this picture. You have numbers that we change during training when we want to adapt the output depending on a certain input. And the nodes be in between all of these connections are functions, very simple functions. I mean, look at this. This is, this is simple. What they do is they sum up all the neurons from the previous layer, multiplied by the weights connecting that layer to the node, to the neuron, sum that up, so take the sum of all of this, and push it through this simple function. If it's negative, it becomes zero. If it's positive, it stays the same. So and if you run this computation for an input, run it through the whole network, then you have an output. That's how a neural network predicts something. It's fairly simple, right? But there is one question remaining. How do we train that thing? Like, how does it learn, actually? Well, for explanatory purposes, 
let us build a simple self-driving car, this thing. What you get is you input images from a camera, say like you have a, a self-driving car that has five cameras and you, you input all of the images into the neural network. And what you want to get out is the angle for the steering wheel and the speed that the car should go with. Okay, that's a use case, great, how do we train it? One way to train it is by using professional drivers. Say we have a couple people that we know are very good at driving and we just let them drive that same car that the neural network should drive soon. We would record all the sensor data, we would record all the camera footage, right, while the person is driving, and we would also record the actions that he decided to take. So if he decided to go fast and steer left, given a certain image or given a certain situation, we record that. And by that, we are building a data set of input and output pairs. And now comes the trick, right? We give the neural network that same situation that the human was, trained, uh, was facing, observe what it would have done by running that whole calculation that I showed you before, and then we compare the two. Well, optimally, they would be equal, right? That's what we want to achieve with this. How do we get to that? Well, obviously, as you remember, when you change the weights, or the, uh, the, the calculation of the neural network depends on the weights. So if we change the weights, the output changes. And that's what, what we want to do. We want to change the output into a particular direction. So we simply change the weights a little bit. Right? We just add or subtract a bit from these numbers. And by doing that, we get the output of the neural network closer to what the human did, if we do it in the right direction. And that's easily to be done with a mathematical procedure called gradient descent. That's super easy calculus, actually, if you're into math, look into it. Pretty easy, but not uh, for an 18-minute TED talk. <laughs> yeah, but there is one problem with this. Probably some of you see it, might not be the best driver, right? Might not be perfect, still causing accidents. We wouldn't really want to learn from something that's not perfect. So. Can we fix this? Can we fix the fact that our training data might not be perfect? And in this case, that would be quite bad if we couldn't, because then our neural network would have learned from someone holding a smartphone while they're driving. Not a good example, right? So we want to fix this. How can we fix this? Well, we need to somehow get rid of the expert data. And that's done by using a learning procedure called reinforcement learning. If you sort of want to draw a comparison to humans, what I've showed you before it's sort of like what babies do with their parents. They think their parents are perfect, and they simply try to imitate everything that they do, right? But as they grow older, they discover that that, not might, be, uh, that might not be perfect, and they start to explore. They do things that, well, their data didn't give them, and they see how well they perform. They, they get the feedback from the world, and if it was good, they try to do that more often, and if it was bad, they don't do it anymore. And that's reinforcement learning in a nutshell. So what you do is you take the outputs from the neural network, actually execute them in the real world. And now comes the point. We have to define what good and what bad means. So we have to define that for a car, for example, reaching your destination is good, driving over some person is bad, and somehow turn this into a mathematical function that outputs something we, call, we can call reward. That's the number still, like just good or badness, basically. So that's it. We try to learn from that. We try to learn from our defined notion of what good, what's good and what's bad. We don't learn from a strategy that was given by human examples. But since trying random things in the real world usually doesn't result in happiness, in case of self-driving cars, because that would probably cost a couple lives, we usually do these things in simulation. And that's why reinforcement learning is focused on games so much. That's why there are so many papers published that just care about games today. Games have these very great features for AI. For example, that score is very well defined. There is a very clear notion of reward. That's a philosophical problem, how you define that. With games, that's sort of inherent. And you have a very clear observation. With cars, you'd usually have your sensor data, right? You'd have LiDAR sensors and camera sensors and all these complex things. With games, you have a game screen and that's it. So we can focus on the AI. And also the buttons. It's just like some couple of buttons that you could press. So that's easy. Good. But how does it learn? Let me get to that. Again, the graph is actually simpler than the one before. <laughs> we take the screen, run the calculation through the neural network, see what it would do, right? just the action that the neural network would take, execute that action in the environment, a let, actually let Pac-Man move, right? really do it, <laughs> and then observe the reward, observe the score. And now comes the thing, instead of changing the weights so that the actions get closer to what a human would have done, we try to change the weights 
so that the actions that happen to give us a higher reward than the average become more likely. So view this as probabilities. We want to increase the probability of actions that were more rewarding than the average. Right? That makes sense. And we want to decrease, of course, the probability of actions that turned out to be less rewarding than the average. Good actions, bad actions. Pretty simple. So we again change the weights, change this mathematical formula, a neural network is nothing but that, to output a higher probability for good actions. Pretty simple. Run this for a couple million iterations, and you actually have a program that plays Pac-Man better than any human could. And that worked for Go. That's why the Go program that Google built, AlphaGo, is so much better than humans, because it didn't learn, or the version 2 didn't learn from human examples. That's the contrast between the two versions. Version 1 learned from human examples. Version 2 learned this way. But wait, there are two players in Go. One thing is missing, right? Pac-Man is a single-player game. How could we incorporate that? How could we include multiple players in this system? Well, it turns out to be super simple. You just train them against each other. And in the case of OpenAI's recent research, it looks like this. And what you see is quite interesting. Like, first of all, of course, because the physics engine isn't perfect, they move a bit weird. But <laughs> what you notice is they actually sort of they don't give away what they will do, right? They, they wait until their opponent does something, and only then do they communicate what their action will be. So they, they really exploit each other's behaviors. They really try to sort of develop robust policies that play well, no matter whether their opponent is stupid or not, pretty much. And by learning, while learning, these systems keep improving parallel with each other. They always have a competitor that's on the same level. And because you always have a competitor on the same level, you can keep getting better and better by trying to see what wins against that competitor on the same level. So you get better and better. That's why AlphaGo version 2, AlphaGo 0 it's called, was so much better. So still, why isn't AI superhuman then? Right? We've just seen like so many cool things. And in fact, the first procedure I showed you, this supervised learning thing where you, where you learn from data, that's not a joke, it's actually used for skin cancer detection. And because they only used lab, um, lab results for the data, it's better than what human doctors do. And that, that has huge implications for us, for, as a, for us as a society. But still, the question remains, why don't we have super smart robots that could deliver this speech, for example? I don't know, like, I don't want to call myself super smart, that's not what I intended. Whatever. So, like, really, I didn't. <laughs> I just made this up. Yeah, okay. So, why don't we have superhuman AI? Look at this image, what do you see? Well, you see a projector with an image on it. If I give this to an AI, it sees nine numbers. A zero for each field if there is nothing in it, a one if there is a circle in it, and a two if there is an X in it. Its output would have to be one of nine actions. Put your X into this field, this field, this field, this field, or whatever, right? How would this thing ever develop a complex understanding of the real world? of the connections between different tasks and different problems, right? It will always just understand this problem. So it's inherently needed to present our AI algorithms with very complex and general problems for them to develop very complex and general understanding of the world. If we look at us humans, we have that, right? We always perform muscle movements. I, I can't actually speak words. What I can do is I can move my muscles so that my vocal cords vibrate in a certain way to generate sounds with various frequencies that you perceive as words. That's what my body is able to do. And I'm not able to move my arm from A to B, I'm able to contract muscles and not contract muscles. That's the action set that I can perform. And no matter whether I play chess or whether I run, I still have the same muscles and I have to use the same muscles. So we always have the same way to act. We also always have the same observation type. We see with the same eyes, we have the same resolution. That doesn't change, that doesn't improve for a game if we like, discover that one game is better viewed as in this way and one is better viewed in this way. No, we see that way. We hear, we listen, we, we smell, we taste, we feel. Always the same input signal, no matter what problem we try to solve. And I believe this is one of the key reasons the fact that we couldn't include this in our current AI systems, that we don't have general superhuman AI. But we are moving into that direction. And one such 
moving into that direction step is OpenAI's Jim Retro data set. That's a data set of 1,000 games. While they, always, uh, while they all play on the same console, they are quite different in terms of mechanics, in terms of goals that have to be achieved. And what they want to do with this data set is they want to encourage researchers to try to train on, say, 900 of these games and test your performance on the other 1,000. So you'd like to have a general understanding in the algorithm of what an objective in a game is and how to efficiently learn to achieve it because that's what we do. If we are presented with a new problem, we don't need to train from scratch, we don't need to train a specific strategy for that game only. We can use our past knowledge to apply it to pro problems we, so uh, we solve today. And that's what they want to encourage. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we are actually on a good path to the technology that AI research wanted to form in the beginning, 60 years ago, intelligence that's actually smarter than we are. But one last thing, and I want to close off with that, AI, and especially general superhuman AI, has lots of implications. It's important to understand the principles of it and to understand where it would be coming from and to understand what it is for you to be able to participate in decisions that, are, that hopefully are democratic in the future. That the, the reason these decisions are important, the decisions will be how this is used, first of all, why this is used, and where it is developed. Right now, AGI is the major research field in many corporates, in many large corporates, in many large firms. And that possesses some risks, because if you have profit as your main goal as a researcher, you tend to neglect safety. And with intelligence that multiplies as quickly as AlphaGo's intelligence did, that might be a problem. And that's also a reason why OpenAI is such a great uh, institution. They focus on safety. And I think safety decisions should not be made by a few selected researchers. And today, by the way, these safety decisions are not yet really important, but they will be soon, I think. And for you to participate in this safety decisions, security, AI safety, it is important that you understand the principles of AI. And that's precisely the reason why I smuggled the bit of AI education into this today. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.